so but when you were at your sort of peak of Osiris, you know, which I guess was the first record, um, you mentioned Hiroshima and I think uh, somebody else. Who who else did you actually get out and play with? Any any other name bands? No, sir. You know, we didn't um they didn't hook us up with them, just with war and them, you know. I did a couple of shows with war, you know. But um, no, sir, you know, a lot of the shows that we did, I kinda like you know, the headline, you know, over here in the D.C. area. Now, later on, they did a little tour, you know, with uh, the Barcades, you know, and Zap, you know, and uh, Sugar Hill Gang, you know, and I forgot somebody else was on that show. Um, I think Cameo may have been on that show. I'm not sure, you know, but I you know, did a few tours with them, and that was it. You know. What was your What was your uh, live act like at that time? Well, I mean, what was your live act like? Oh, oh. You know, there was a point that I had even incorporated a harp, you know, on my shows, you know. Uh, the live act was very, um, now I gotta say this, now please understand me, okay? Cause that, this is no tripping, okay? And, and honestly, no tripping. But whenever we did, it was very hard for people to follow up, you know? And uh, so we were kind of like, it was very, we, we tried to be as solid as possible. That's all that it was, no tripping now. Cause I wanted to show, wanted to do a show, like I said, giving all all respect. But later on, nobody wanted to perform with us. You see, you know, we got several shows turned down because they did not want to perform with us. You know, when nobody going through the changes, I was looking forward, you know, <laughs> to being on the shows with those great acts, you know, whom I respect and love, you know. But uh, they kind of like, you know, backed off from us, you know. So, because Warner Brothers had a tour. You know, set up and uh, then the people backed up said uh, they don't want us on it. And it couldn't have been because of our live performance, because our live performances, we always shut the house down, you know, because we made sure that people got everything. We, we, we made sure that they got everything from us. We left it out on the floor. Like the song uh, Damn that you spoke about, when we did it live, the ending was like, you know, a cold blooded rock show. You know what I mean? You know, with the screams and everything and the accents and so forth, you know, the, you know, the rum drums. We did it. We tore it up. You know, we left everything out there when we did it, you know. And uh, unfortunately, as far as shows are concerned, that caused us not to be wanted to perform with a lot of the, uh, you know, the major acts, you know. But, but that's okay. You know, that's okay. And, and you attribute that to what? Our live performances were pretty powerful. So you think Yeah, very very hard to follow. I get you. Yeah. So hard to follow because we had we did stuff like say you will and like I said, the dam and everything. But now my boy is that followed up though when we did the show and he, he ended up <laughs> stripping. And so that, that took you of that, right? <laughs> when we did the show down south, you know what I'm saying? He came up behind us, you know. He stripped, so that eliminated who cares who was in front of him, right? <laughs> Because <laughs> everybody loved the fact that he did what he did, Roger did what he did, you know, so that was good. That was good. Yeah, I saw Roger several times. He yeah. would do that kind of shtick and also um, get carried by the bouncers, like in from the back playing his guitar. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. So did you feel uh, at home on the stage yourself? Did you like being out in front of people? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was a natural, uh, you know, togetherness. Because like I said, it's about making love, you know. And that's what I wanted to do with my audience, you know, is make love, you know. Give it to them sweet, give it to them nasty, give it to them gritty, you know. Just have some fun, Scott. You know what I mean? You know, it's hard for people to understand what fun is, you know. We make issues out of everything, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but I uh, just wanted to have some fun, you know. So we gave it, you know, everything. And I was not bashful when it comes to the stage. You know, me or anybody else. I didn't do a lot of dancing, but I did a lot of, uh, I gave you all of me, you know, so. Yeah. You weren't doing a lot of pre-recorded tracks and lip syncing. like. <laughs> Sir, I'm sorry, say it again. I said you weren't using a lot of pre-recorded tracks and lip syncing, right? Oh, no, sir. No way. <laughs> no way. At no time, sir. You know, because these guys, we had to be on it. It was music. You know, we had to be on it. You know, we didn't do that. Um, do that at all, no sir. Awesome. So the third record in '81. Interesting thing about this one, to me, it may have had the most commercial-looking cover, or polished-looking cover out of all the records. So, 
you know, I would think that might have helped it in stores. But um, the lead song, Grit on It, which is like that saying you like to use. Yes, sir. Oh, phenomenal. I mean, that is a hard, hard track. It's definitely got the grit on it. And then yes, some. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Bless your heart. Yeah. Um, how'd you come up with like a groove like that? Did it just come from rehearsing or did it, you know, how did it evolve? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It just came from working, rehearsing. We rehearse, we rehearse, you know, then the ideas, you know, when they pop up, you know, then we say, hey, you know, let's elaborate on that. You know, somebody have an idea about something or maybe she'll play a few chords or something, you know, and we like the way that chord, you know, that movement was, you know, or the guitar player, you know, would come in and do a few things, you know, Jackie Lee and them. We had a, a great guy, Terry Scott. He's underrated also, sir. You know, he's one of the greatest guitar players, okay? You know, but he uh, he's underrated also. Just want to throw that in there, you know, because there's a lot of great musicians, you know, that I have been blessed to be able to be around, you know? And so, you know, just wanted to, you know, give you that, you know? So, but we would get around and we have the ideas, you know, because Terry's playing on that album, you know, that that part of that middle, that nasty part of the guitar part. Right there, hey, that's Terry, bad boy. Oh. You know what I mean, bad boy, you know. So, uh, you know, we would just get together. Now, when I got with Terry, Terry wasn't with me when we hooked it up. Hooked it up. We would hook it up without him. And then I called Terry to come in and do the guitar because he wasn't a member of our band, but he was an old friend of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's how we operated with that, you know. So you're like, you knew that it needed a little something else right there. Dang. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. All instinctual, you know, but absolutely no formula. Because I could, you know, I could not look at another song and say, but they doing this and they doing that. And then let's do this, let's do that. I couldn't do that. You know, it, it has to fall natural because I want to give you a variety. I want to give you something that everybody else can't give you. You know what I mean? I can't do that by being like everybody else, even though the essence of it is the power of the funk, you know, the power of the groove. That's the essence of it. We lay right there, then everything else falls in place. But I just did my best to be a uh, participant. You know, to just contribute my my part. Speak to me, Osiris, a little bit about Ty Brunson because you know I became familiar with him through his own record, Sticky Situation, yes. and um, you know Smurf. I think was another hit he had, and I think most people and funk fans, music fans, know him better yes. through that. So um, that came just a couple of years after this, right? In terms of the chronology. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, he hooked up with some uh, guys, the Redding Brothers. You know, he hooked up with them, you know, after we had, uh, you know, disbanded, you know, uh, so to speak, in terms of the unit disbanding. You know, of course, I kept, you know, operating and dwelling on music, you know, but, uh, you know, Ty, you know, hooked up with the Redding Brothers and he did a great job. That was a great group that they gave him, you know, and uh, he was a great guy. Like I said, he would be a problem. You know, and on um, the uh, Ozone album, so the Taz Great Cat, and on the uh, on the Grit on the album, Taz on the also. Yeah, so is he he's just a force of nature in the studio, or what was he like? Yes, yeah, so, oh, it was, it was, he's uh, well, see, he did the color thing for me. You feel me? You know, we had Tony Jones stand in the pocket, right? You know, making sure right there with that foot banging that pocket, and then Ty, he was a nasty dude, right? <laughs> You know, on that base, right? You know, he would put those colors and work around it and everything. Terrible, great, great, great musician, Scott. You know, and that was totally appreciated, man. You know, yeah, but two bass players. So, how many guys total were in the band officially at that time? Oh boy, how many do we have? Uh, e, Mace. Uh, on one week we have over me, Mace, and Jill, and uh, Ty, Tony, Kenny. Um, between seven and and ten, because we had Brent Mingle, and uh, we had Andrew Newman, you know, and we had Shasha Stapleton. So we were between, you know, seven and ten at any given time. I didn't have a stable number of guys that were operating. And were you responsible for um, all of the vocal arrangements? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos. Yes, sir. Let's answer. Thank you. 
I got to tell you, though, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but on that um, Osiris the Band record from 81, yes, um, the tower very much reminds me of Firecracker Mass Production. I understand. I understand, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, the tower was a strong song, you know, and, and Firecracker, you know, without doing that time. Yes, sir. You know, that was a great song, too. Yeah, so some influence, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like I said, you're influenced by everything around you. Right. You know what I mean? Everything that you enjoy. You know, those things were hit, you know, and uh, anything funky, I've always absorbed it, you know, so, and then it came out at different times on different songs, you know. Yeah. Too bad it didn't hit like Firecracker did, though, I mean. I know, I know, I know, because like I said, it was the thing, I was the independent label, and it's dealing with the business a certain kind of way, you know, um, people, uh, things happen, life comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't because, you know, we didn't want to, you see, you know, but when people, when they're coming at you and they're operating and then they change on you in the midst of it all, you see, you know, that leaves us, you know, leaves us out like that. How, how, did, how did you roll with those punches? I mean, did you ever get really frustrated? I mean, did, did your significant other have to, like, calm you down at some point? Or, <laughs> I mean, how did you roll with this? I know, I know, sir. Now, nobody uh, had to calm me down. I uh, I took it as a king, you know, because my heart was in the music and whatever happens with it. You know, my faith keeps me stable, you know, you know, in terms of the most high. It keeps me stable, you know. So, and I did the music because I love music. That's a gift from the most high, right? You know, even from the very beginning, if you look back, you know, in Genesis, it's a gift from the most high, you know. So it's a beautiful thing, you know, and I just dealt with the, uh, the essence of it. You know, and because of that, I have been on the outside of everything. And I'm glad that I wasn't trying to be a star, Scott. Because <laughs> that, that definitely didn't happen like that, right? <laughs> so I'm glad that, that wasn't my effort, you know. I would have been frustrated if that was my effort, right? You know, but that wasn't my effort. You know, my effort was just, what can I do? If I don't get it, it's not mine to have. And that's all right. I feel like I'm more frustrated than you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, bless your heart. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, I want to knock some heads together. You're all like Zen with it. <laughs> I said, I want to knock some heads together. You're oh, all, yeah. you're Zen with it. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well. After that, you had a, a hiatus for several years. You came back in 86 with uh, War on the Bullshit. Yes. Um, that was a great track, very powerful. Um, I think, again, the Gil Scott Heron sort of thing. Um, I understand, I understand. Like I said, you know, in, in growing up, you know, the revolution would not be televised. That was, a, you know, that was strong. And I absorbed all good music, you know. I was doing all the good music, you know, so I can understand that, you know, the, uh, the relationship, you know. But War on the Bullshit, you know, primarily that was just making the statement on what it is, you know. I declare music warfare, you know, for the grit, you know. Um, the world may not be able to get help immediately, but that's okay, you know. But that's who I am. That's where I'm coming from. You know, all I want to do is just give you all that I have. I want to make love. You know, with the music, you know, give you all that I have, you know, and that's it. And whatever happens from that, I just leave it on the floor, leave it in the air, leave it in the cosmos, if you know how we want to look at it, you know, and just let things fall as they may, you know. But I, I war, you know, war on all BS, you know. I mean, don't you want to be, people want to be, you know what I'm saying, you know, eliminate all of the extra stuff in there, right? You know, yeah. just go straight to the point, make me feel good. What's, what's up with this here, you know? But we go through too many changes. You know, so. Well, it's a heck of a time. I mean, it's in the middle of Reaganomics and, uh, yes. you know, the country. And, and, well, and there was not much. There was not much artistic integrity being demonstrated in the music industry at that time. I mean, to me, well, you know, Pr Prince was like an ex exception. Yes, sir. He was doing. Um, and there's a few exceptions. But it was. You know, MTV, the vi music videos had taken over. Yes, sir. Uh, corporate, yeah. the corporate labels. I mean, it was a tough time. You are so right. Yeah. You are so right. You know, if you didn't fall in line, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, nobody had time for it. Labels were telling the R&B acts and the funk acts that you sounded 
you know, can you sound less black, you know, stuff like that. It was crazy. You hit it right on the head. You are a musicologist, aren't you, sir? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. It's I see. Yeah. I see, because you, you hit it right on the head. You know, these are the changes that we, the artists have gone through, you know, especially during that time, you know. Uh, right before then, you could do an album, three or four songs of the album. You could you know, design the album the way you want in terms of the music. You know, one song, um, you remember the day, one song would last like a whole side when we did the vinyls back then. You know what I mean? In the Gala the Vita and so forth, all of the yeah. gags, right? You know, so, yeah, so, you know, but then all of a sudden, everything changed, you know, and you just had to get commercial. And you know who my reference point is as far as being commercial is. Bobby Womack. Uh, you say you're, you're talking about commercial, right? <laughs> or the song close to you. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, like, you know, being commercial, you know what I mean? God you know, bless him too. Yeah. All thing, yeah. huh? it's God bless him too, yes. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so everything's beautiful, sir. Yeah. Well, and not too long after that, I think um, George Clinton put out R and B skeletons in the closet. Yes, sir. R&B what now? R&B Skeletons in the Closet. Oh, okay, okay. I, I wasn't here, but I didn't hear that one. Yeah. Okay. I didn't hear that one. Yeah, a little bit after. It was top. probably like uh, 87, maybe. Okay, okay. What did he have on it? Um, well, the whole premise was about, you know, these groups, like, kind of selling out and uh -huh. keeping their R&B skeletons in the closet, oh, the new okay, music okay. in the closet. Okay, okay. I didn't. I, I wasn't hip to that one. You know, yeah, yeah. I was busy trying to figure out, make sure that I'm on. You know what I mean with what I'm doing and what they were doing with me, right? With yeah. the, the industry, you know. Yeah. But that's um, that's a great premise right there. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It was his last record for Capitol Records. Coincidence? That other. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, I don't think it's coincidence. Sir. I'm with you. So, uh, what else would you say um, stands out to you about the um, disc that Warren the Bullshit was on? Because there was some uh, like grit on it's on there again, and uh, you know what is it with this record? Was it a compilation or what was it? Well, on the grit on the album, War on the Bullshit, the, the oh, album. Oh, oh, it won the bullshit primarily. Um, I just wanted to throw that out. I had a couple other songs that dealt with Jim Rose records. You know, one was slipping in the back door, you know, and, you know, Warner Bullshit, you know, and uh, had one called, you know, Fun. Um, you know, these are things uh, I just, I was throwing out the singles because it was during the 12 inch time and I was doing the singles. So I never did get a chance to uh, really compile that for an album per se, you know, but I think somebody did, um, people called on Bad, B A A D, overseas label. I think yeah. they put together to compile some of my material. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at here. Yes, sir. Some of the other cuts um, remind me a little bit, and you talk about taking all those influences. It's only natural. I mean, everybody uh, did that, but yes, sir. Um, some parts of it remind me a little bit of like the Midnight Star funk, you know, but okay, a little bit of that. Okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what happened after that? With your music i've been yes sir i've been uh chilling you know just uh, absorbing everything because you know making sure that i can figure out how i'm operating within this industry that is based upon you know operating with record companies you know the record companies that came out around 79 or so said no longer will the stars be you know i mean the artists be the stars we are the stars you know and that's their anthem and I, like i said earlier I understand, you know, just that when you make an agreement, you should stick to the agreement. You know what I mean? Or at least understand if you don't make the agreement, understand why, you know? So uh, that's what's happening at that time. So I just laid, laid low and, you know, kept things coming as it, as it was. Cause in here in DC, putting out a tune, like I put out a little, uh, you know, a couple of songs, you know, um, weren't the greatest mixes for me, you know, but I put out a couple of songs, you know, and, uh, you know, just to, you know, just to keep the, you know, keep, keep it going a little bit, you know, good songs, you know, uh, but everything I had to be like, it's like everybody around me, you know, in terms of the business had like, did a about face, so to speak, because uh, Osiris doesn't uh, comply, you know, but I, but I, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue. I would just say, let's be fair. Let's be, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Let's just be correct. You know, I will supply you with all the funk, all the funk you need. You know what I mean? You know, just let's be fair, you know, in our exchange. But it was very hard to do that. You know, so um, I've just been laying and laying and laying and laying. And, uh, you know, Black Rhythmic Records, I put it together a compound, you know, compilation of, um, of my stuff. Uh, some of the best of Osiris, you know. And um, I got um, the, um, my, I got three groups on the label, you know, on Black Pyramid Records. You know, I got three groups there. And it's about uh, Straight Eight, uh, Trilogy, and New Era. And they happen to be eight, eight guys, and they happen to be my sons, you know. So uh, they, uh, you know, they're doing it, you know, now, you know. And I still got a lot to give, Scott. You know, I still got a lot that I want to do, you know, just waiting for the opportunity, you know, to arise, you know, for me to get that done. What kind of style music are they doing? Um, well, the younger group, you know, New Era, they're R&B, hip hop, you know, and uh, the Rhodey the rappers, they're, they're rap and hip hop, you know, and then all together, they, you know, they, they blend it a certain kind of way, you know, but that's where they're at, you know, and uh, as they get, after they finish getting themselves together a certain kind of way, I want to feed in because they begin to get to that point. That point, I want to feed in to that sort of funk with it, if you know what I mean. You know, you get that body going, but I want them to breathe. I don't want them to be a direct duplication. I want them to be who they are, and then we incorporate the whole thing. But I let them grow and let them breathe. What was your take when when rap started, kind of came in and started dominating and the sampling and all that? What, yeah. what was your uh, opinion of it and, and comfort level with it i once in a while i would hear somebody like bone thugs and harmony i would hear that they would keep music in the rap some some of the acts didn't keep music you know uh some of them just get with just a straight sample and of course you know the commercial side you know when you start hearing things a certain kind of way okay all oh, that's fine you know um but and i say to each his own Right, you know, when they doing that, you know, but I couldn't get into that, you know, when that whole thing started. I didn't back out, you know, but I just couldn't get into that per se, into that whole sampling thing, you know. But I don't knock nobody, you know. They, if they, that's what they need to do. That's what they need to do, you know. Uh, but I, I don't do that, you know. That's all that that is, you know. And I didn't let that discourage me, and I did not let that uh, um, dominate my perception of putting out, putting out music. I didn't let that do that either, you know. So I just waited and waited and waited, and I've been waiting and waiting. <laughs> but everything is good, though. You know, everything is good. So you must have a lot of um, songs written or and or recorded somewhere, someplace. Do you have a big backlog of stuff? Yes, sir. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a whole bunch of stuff, and um, just waiting for that time, you know, to be shared with the world. Do you do you have much that's got actual band on it, or you know now that recording technology has changed so much, where you can really do your own thing yeah. in your own house? Yes. Um, no. Now, the stuff that I have, I have the old recordings, you know. But like I said, they're on. You know, some of the band stuff is there, but I can't put that out because of the levels, you know. And nowadays, you know, comparing the levels, I would, I don't have the uh, twenty-four tracks. I don't have them all separated. They're all on cassettes and stuff like that. You know, so, but the songs are there, you know, so, but in terms of getting them done, when I redo them, I'm redoing with a band, you know, so that's what has to happen there. You know, I got to have the real music. I have to have the guys. Yeah. You mentioned um, the best of, and I know uh, since, um, I guess about 10 years now, I got it called up on the screen here, but the best of Osiris, you know, viewers out there can get that on Amazon. It's a nice collection. Of tracks i do recommend getting all the actual records if you can yes, but it's certainly a great introduction to osiris and uh, I, I i hope i hope you do get some royalties off that or something <laughs> yes sir I'm, i hope so too <laughs> <laughs> back then the days right you know back in the days you had to sign a publishing you're dealing with warner brothers you're dealing with these other you know um i forgot the name of the people that billy michelle you know, with different publishing companies back in the day. And of course they sit back and they renew, you know, the copyrights and everything, you know, so, but everything is good though. I'm, 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 I'm good, you know, for whatever happens. Cause like I said, I take responsibility for every decision that I've made. And all I want to do is just do my best, you know, to uh, give you the real thing, you know, 
and he's going to provide that for us. If you had to describe yourself, the Osiris band sound, how would you tell somebody that's never heard it before? What I used to say is, you know, everything you wanted to hear, we got it right here. You know, everything you've always wanted to hear. It's, uh, it's uh, gosh, it's soulful. Okay, you know, it's soulful, but it's got, it's classy. You know, to make sure the music is classy, you know, but it's very soulful. That's that's the primary word. I can just say it's soulful, you know, because I'm going to give you everything, you know. So yeah, that's the primary word, soulful. How do you take care of that uh, great voice of yours? <laughs> <laughs> I try to relax and I exercise every, every day, you know, my vocal practices and all of that, you know. It's have fun. Yeah, you know, you know, make sure that I'm ready. It's two questions I often ask on this show, and that's one is, you know, what makes funk special to you, and why do you think it continues to endure? Um, so I'll ask that one first. What do you think? What's your take on that? On funk and what by has endured? Yeah, what makes it so special? Yes, sir, because it's real. You know, everything. What we don't. Uh, gather is the fact that all of this primarily comes from hardship or it comes from the blues being able to sing the blues being able to know what it means to go through changes and funk you know is a manifestation of that when it gets nasty you understand me you know when this hit those beats a certain kind of way it hits the, the inner spirit the inner the inner ear you see you know and you can feel it that's why it lasts because as long as we go through changes you know that funk you know that grit you know is all the way up in there you feel me? So that's going to last. Anybody who's void of that, they got an issue. You know what I mean? You know, because anybody with feeling, you're going to have the funk. I'm so glad I, I saw a little preview on your book, you know, and you want to make sure that funk has a uh, a place, you know, and that was <laughs> because everything is on the one sky. You know, everything we need to know because he's the one upstairs, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he put it down here, laid it on us a certain kind of way. So everything is on the one, sir. You know, and uh, the funk is enduring because that's your blues, that's your feeling, that's your spirit. And anybody who goes through any kind of changes, unless you're just plastic and you don't live and you're just a real robot, you're going to deal with the funk. It's going to touch you. You know, it's going to touch, it's going to grab you, you know. And those guys that were, you know, uh, pushing their forth, you know, the guys like James and, and George and them, you know, beautiful. You know, and I love it. And everybody who they have uh, influenced, Ohio players, all, you know, all of the great ones, right? You know, I love it, you know, and it will continue because somebody, somebody's gonna keep it going, you know, because they can't help it. They're trying to like wash it down, water it down, but uh, somebody's gonna keep it going. I don't know, maybe my album, right? I, I don't know, right? <laughs> you know, but it's gonna keep going, Papa. Yeah, yeah, I sure hope so. Yes, sir. Um, being truthful in music, the show's called Truth and Rhythm. Yes, sir. What to you makes music tell truth and how can musicians remain truthful to themselves and what they create the thing is that they have to understand first of all who they are you know because just like the world has a lot of actors you know in terms of movies and everything which is a craft so you know don't misunderstand me you know it's, it's acting a lot of people try to uh emulate funk by using a certain formula, you know, use, you know, certain beats and so forth and so on, boom, you know, but if you're going to last, if you're going to last, you can't just, you can't fake the one, okay, you just, you can't fake the one, you can't, either you do or you don't, and if you're going, it's going to last, if a musician, if he can find out and understand why he do what he does, therefore nothing can change his mind, nothing can move him, you know, that he's going to continue on, but he has to understand who he is. Because if it's a light matter and you're just going out there trying to get a couple of hit records and that's all it means to you, then that's all you're going to get. You know, you get a couple of hit records, put the formula in there, boom, you know, okay, bam. You know, but uh, five years from now, who knows you? You feel me? You know, what kind of impact did you have on souls? I feel like music is the thing where as you're supposed to connect with souls and not just on the surface in terms of the club or the radio, but to connect with people. That's why he gave it to us. You know, we connect, you know, and we just vibe, we get strong together. Mm -hmm. So if they can figure out who they are and be serious about it and try not to because they cannot fake who they are. 
Yeah. Just like if it feels right and connects internally to them, and if and you feel like it's touching others in a similar yeah. way. Yes. Stick with that. Exactly. Exactly, sir. You know. Exactly. Um, is there anyone out there today or that in the past five, ten years that you kind of really dig in music today or not so much? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Truth, baby. Yes, yeah. you know, like I said, don't knock anybody, but nobody's turned me on. You know? Yeah, that's yeah, it's sad state of affairs there. Um, what would you say looking back is your most unforgettable memory associated with music? Oh, man. Associated with the business or just music period? Music period, whether it was finalizing a particular track that you thought was amazing or a certain performance or meeting somebody or whatever. I understand, I understand. One of the most gratifying times was basically, you know, corny as this may sound, but it's when me and the guys got together, you know, and we said we we're going to do this. Me and Maceo and Tony and, you know, uh, Ty and, and Kenny and everybody, we said we we're going to do this. That felt so warm because everything just hit and that was strong. It was powerful. It was the kind of thing that you cannot contrive. And that's why I loved it. You see, you know, it wasn't like I got this guy to do that, boom, 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 and then you write it all out and everybody play the parts. No, we came about with our music based on how we felt. And that was very, with me and Mace and, and Ty and Tony and Kenny, you know, uh, we got together and did that thing. Sir, and Sha Sha and percussion, sir. You know, it was beautiful and it could not be replaced. The business came in and interfered with the spirit yeah. of the music. You know what I mean? And I know they always say, right? It's called the music business. So I understand that, right? You know, but I'm just saying to you, you know, memorable parts is when we were able to click. You know, no circumstances outside of in terms of us being advanced to anything. Just simply because we love the music and we all came together and agreed and said yes. You can replace that. You can't contrive it. It's not pretentious. You know, it was just it was just wonderful. That was my most most greatest memory with that with the music. One of the things that I feel like I envy the most about not being a musician in a band is being able to feel that chemistry connection that certain unique uh, individuals get collectively oh yes and when they're right in that pocket and writing a groove oh yeah just operating as one oh yes <laughs> that's what that's what i you know i try to feel it vicariously but man it's gotta be something oh man it is you know when you're kicking you know we did the thing of um when we went to warner brothers right you know they had us you know perform for everybody right you know standing ovation because it was fantastic. I'm talking about we had Shaka Khan, Norma Whitfield, Larry Graham, Prince, everybody was out there because the whole Warner Brothers people were, were rocking us, right? You know, and uh, hey, you know, standing ovation. And not just being nice, but we tore it up, you know what I mean? You know, but it was a standing ovation because the chemistry with those guys, you know what I mean? It was just awesome, you know, and you just can't go out and buy that. I've had musicians come in and just play parts, and there's no feeling the part is there. But there's nothing, there's magic. There's no magic, you know? And what I look for, because music is part of me like that, I look for the magic. You know, it's something that's within that, the feeling that comes behind playing that exact same note that these other people have played. But the way you play that note, you can tell the difference and it comes off at you and it connects a certain kind. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are so right, sir. And that's why 40 years later, I still feel it. And I think anybody will off your recordings. Bless your heart, sir. Um, is there anything else, you know, while you're still, you know, in this existence? Yes. Uh, what, what do you hope to accomplish before it's said and all, all said and done? Yeah. Um, okay. And that aspect, you know, the guys are doing the thing, you know, and that's fine, you know. I'm going to do my thing, you know, and that's fine, you know, and truly, Scott, the way that it is when I said in the very beginning, 
you know, I take it for what I'm content in all that happens. You feel me? You know, I'm content. I have the drive. I have the drive. I'm always hungry, but I'm content. You know, uh, whatever happens, because I can't, I can't uh, measure that. You know what I mean? You know, I can't. I just can't measure that. I got to deal with whatever comes. You know, whatever. You know, the Creator has a mind for me. You know, but I just got to do my part in making sure I put the grit on it. You know, because if I have any expectations, what do they do? They lead up to what? Disappointments, right? <laughs> you know, frustrations and everything, right? You know, because you're dealing with people. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you're dealing with people all the time, you know? So you're trying to, you know, get into that point, and then they may change their mind. So what's up? Then you left hanging, right? So you can't do that. You know, you have to do who you are, make sure you understand who you are and do it, and that's all that I want to do. You know, just, you know, just give, 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 give. And then I'll take whatever comes back to me when it comes. <laughs> if um, people want to check out your music, yes, sir. What's the best way you recommend they do that at this day and age? Uh, the CD baby, you know, I got that thing on it, you know, and it goes to those sites website. You know, uh, several people have posted several singles, you know, uh, from the albums and everything, you know. And um, but CD Baby has the best of all service, you know, available for everybody. And like I said, Amazon, you know, I think it's moving around a little bit, you know, but that's the primary, uh, you know, source for it, you know. And then when we do the thing, hmm? Black Pyramid Records, I'm going to put it on sale. I'm going to put that on the website on Black Pyramid Records, you know. Um, that's you know, my, my daughter just reminded me, <laughs> you know, so uh, there's uh, we're going to do that, you know, yes, sir, you know, so they can operate. Black Premier Records, CD Baby. And of course, you're going to let uh, Funkin' Stuff know my site if you put something out. Oh, oh thank you, sir. <laughs> right? Well, definitely. You're absolutely yeah. right, sir. Yeah. Funkin' Stuff. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll tune in to you all. So bless your heart. You know, and, uh, you know, they can get, get my material through you too. So bless your heart, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're welcome. Is there any other uh, message you want to get out to uh, fans or viewers before we sign off? Uh, no, sir. You know, just you know, keep it on the O. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the O is for the one, right? Hey, Ben, that's all. You know, and y'all bless everybody. Y'all bless you. And thank you so much for being so kind and patient with me. I do appreciate it, sir. Hey, so after my initial interview with Osiris, he realized that he had neglected to mention some key folks that he had known and had crossed paths with and some of the great talent that had come out of Washington, D.C. And so he asked to record his response to the question, basically, of who else did he come up with and work with during those years? And, you know, what was the talent that came out of the D.C. area? So here's what he had to say. But here in D.C., there's nowhere in the world, right? I can leave out these great musicians and great artists that come from this city. All righty, they had it on lockdown, Scott, okay, on real lockdown. We had the great, during the time that I was singing with the doo-wops, right? We had the great Al Johnson and the Unifics, you know, coming out of here, okay? Fantastic young man, okay? Then we had um, Skip Mahoney and the Casuals, okay? They had made some records and everything, you know, great singers. I was surrounded by great singers, Papa, okay? Uh, we had uh, uh, Father's Children, we had the Choice Four, along with the Stradios and the Deacons, you know. Uh, but that was one thing, and we were able to get all of the clubs. We had special delivery, George Parker, all right, young man named Terry Huff, fantastic singers. Okay, that's one of the reasons why also that it's not a competition, because there's so many great singers there, right? <laughs> you know, everybody was just vibing and feeding off of each other. You know, but the clubs were really fit with that, okay? You know, these fantastic people, all right? Then it moved over. When I transitioned and I started doing the, um, self-contained unit thing, right? We had such artists, okay, as Jimmy Dugan and the Young Senators, who went on, you know, to uh, play behind Eddie Kendricks. Uh, we had um, uh, Black Heat. We had the great Chuck Brown, okay, and the Soul Searchers, and they just tore it up. One of the main reasons why, as I said, you know, we couldn't do anything, we didn't do anything here through the different path because they had this city on lockdown. Okay, they had it rolling. The people loved it, and every weekend, you know, the joint was packed. You know, the talent here was just awesome. I got to mention two of the young men that I went to school with. Uh, they were um, 
ended up being with Harold Melville's Blue Notes. You know, so uh, your Jerry and Blackie, you know, and everybody that Bo, Bo Sharp, that's a friend of mine, you know, everybody that all of their groups, you know, they were just fantastic singers. That's why it was very hard to try to even compete with anybody. These people were great. Okay, and I just wanted to make sure that you understand that. And uh, the part that as far as uh, other things are concerned, I don't want to leave nobody out. You know, so, so if anybody hears this and, you know, I left them out, believe it was not it, it, intentional. Okay, with so many, so much talent here. You know, and I just wanted to make sure that these guys, you know, got got an understanding and the world knows I love them. I respect them. I'm so honored to have been a part of this D.C. scene, you know. So but like I said, I was always working and we did the, the rock clubs, you know. So that's the only reason why there was a hesitation there, Papa. I, I was always working, Scott. You yeah. know what I mean? Always writing songs, you know what I'm saying? Always rehearsing. We had this little place, you know, in the back of our house, right? You would call it the Little House. And the Osiris Band was just always working, you know? But like I said, these people, they had it. Now, the people there, they rocked it out. They rocked it out. The people with these clubs stayed packed with the young senators. We got such great musicians like Gilbert Pryor, you know, uh, on horn, you know, uh, John Buchanan. You know, all of these people, just great people, mousy. You know, Mousy Thompson, he went on, he played with uh, Chuck, I mean, um, James Brown. You know, he played with him for a while, you know. So uh, we just had all of these great individuals that come from this city, you know, and they definitely ought to get recognized, you know, in terms of their efforts. You know, they were great people. I love them. You know, we were all peers. A lot of us went to school together, you know. So that was the, that's the primary. You can ask me whatever you want. My, my DC uh, connection from back then is I always thought of uh, Donald Byrd and the Blackbirds. And that's the other one I was about to share with you at Howard University. How could we, how could we not know that? Right? <laughs> you know, there was these guys, you know, the Blackbirds, you know, said they were awesome over here. So DC has been a powerhouse of talent, sir. You know, and I'm talking about some of the greatest musicians, the bands here, the Young Senators, Black Heat, Chuck Brown, Soul Searchers, those bands, you know, they could compete with anybody on the planet in terms of being a hot band, okay? There was no doubt about it. Later on, EU came about, you know, Experience Unlimited. They're the ones that did that thing with Max, you know, for uh, for that movie, you know? But, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you know, these are great, great people, great people, Scott, you know, and they ought to be known, and I'm letting them know that I love them. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost like a, you know, I don't be out a lot, but I want them to know that I do love them, and I'm, I respect them, and I appreciate being able to be a part of this whole DC scene, learning so much from all of these great people. Sir Joe and the Free Soul, you know, you know they were right out of here. You know, one of the greatest guitar players in the world, Mr. Jackie Lee, you know, I mean, I'm serious. You know, when I call these people great, you know, Al and Chuck and all these people, they are great. There's no exaggeration there, great artists. I have a question for myself. Okay. You know, George Clinton put out Chocolate City. Yes, Did sir. You know that? Everybody loved it. Everybody loved it in DC. You, you understand me? <laughs> you know, George was a staple over here in DC. We loved him here. You feel me? Yeah, you know, we loved him. Chocolate City was awesome. You know, Tiki Fullwood, I met him, you know, we started vibing and everything. He was drums for uh, you know for him, you know. Um, you know, it was it was it was fantastic. It was fantastic. Oh, and by the way, we got a couple other cats. Ricky Roman played for Miles Davis, you know. So I'm saying the talent, they came here and got talent and went with it, you know? But Chocolate City was an awesome tune. You know, it was an awesome vibe. It was like DC was vibing a certain kind of way. You can't deny the funk. You understand me? You can't deny it, you know? You, you know, um, just uh, on a side note personally, yes, sir. I grew up on the West Coast. When I moved out to the East Coast in uh, 2006, oh, okay. Um, it's been a kick, you know, exploring the East Coast. And I went to D.C. for the first time in my life yes, about uh, four or five years ago. Oh. And okay. uh, it touched me much more than I ever expected it would. Yes, sir. Uh, because I've never been real political. Yes, sir. But um, just being there and actually also uh, seeing Rock Creek Park that I had oh, yeah. you know, heard the Blackbirds music yeah. about. And it was a kick. <laughs> yes, sir. I know it was. And I know it was something for you, see, because it's in your spirit. You know, there's no way in the world you're going to write everything that's on a one without having the spirit on that phone. You understand me? That's you know, right. don't bad touch the papa. You know, because you're up in there. You know, it's one of those things that you can't see, touch, or feel. You just know. 
-hmm. you know, and uh, you are appreciated, you know, for your efforts in doing this there, you know, making people recognize, you know, what's going on here. Thank you. Bless your heart, sir. All right, take good care. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, take care, Osiris. All right, sir. Bye. Oh, all right. Well, hello there. Wait, you mean you have not scoured the internet yet to track all this man's music? My hope is that you did do just that, but decided to return for this exciting conclusion to this episode. Otherwise, make a beeline for that Osiris funk as soon as I do sign off this episode. The man was a delight, was he not? How much do you have to admire his principles and positive outlook? Since before our time was such an appropriate title for the band's first and best album because it clearly was ahead of its time and continues to stand the test of time. Much respect to Mr. Osiris Marsh for adding more truth to truth in rhythm. Also sincere thank you to you, the viewers and listeners on the podcast. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous installments at funkinstuff.net, YouTube, iTunes, and other leading podcast providers. Be sure to subscribe. Subscribe to this program. Subscribe through the Funky Stuff channel on YouTube. If you've already subscribed, please get friends and family to do so. We need that support. Show them that the funk still matters. Keep that funk alive. Keep these artists going. Show that you love their music, that their creativity lives on forever. That's what this is all about. And I want to hear from you. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show. Always juggling many of these uh, shows at one time, usually a dozen or more up in here at one time, trying to make it happen for you. But I'd uh, love to hear from you. So do write me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. And with that, as always, Scott Dr. G. Skullfine signing off saying, keep on vibrating to what? Of course, the rhythm of the one, one baby. <laughs>